So, well, thank you for being with me. Um, what were the most pressing ch uh, challenges to achieving your mandates uh, while you were uh, serving in Afghanistan? So maybe we'll start with you, Tom. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that one of our main challenges is bringing a national government and bringing their focus and attention at the provincial level. Um, a lot of that is focused on bringing the resources, the financial resources down, uh, to make sure that the elected government of uh, the province of Kandahar and the governor uh, can actually manage a budget, uh, can actually pay the salaries of the government officials, of the police, of the military, to make sure that they have the resources in place to govern the province. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's incredibly challenging, and to make sure that the national level fully understands what's going on in Canada. Um, obviously, any of the widespread initiatives, the capacity building and training we're doing, all of that's going to be sustainable as so long as the government is there to do it. Uh, and that can only be done if the line ministries, the various ministries who are responsible, pay attention to Canada and push the resources down. So good governance being one of the, the central keys. Yeah. Um, Colonel, what, what would you say from the, the military, the Canadian Forces perspective? <coughs> no, the Canadian Forces perspective is what we're the Afghan National Security Forces mm -hmm. now. We are involved. Cooperative movement we you know on the Afghan National Police capacity uh, in terms of uh, observing uh, liaison teams that are there to, to assist. But we also got the increase of the RCMPD and peace. So all that is, 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 is done together. Uh, and uh, and then the Afghan National Army that we are fully engaged in, in terms of mentorship. So to me, is the ability to be able to turn over the Afghan National Security Forces and allow them to carry out the counterinsurgency efforts and provide that law it's required for an enduring presence on the road, and it's, it's a major challenge. Let me build on that then. While you were in country, there's been a lot's been said about the ineffectiveness of the Afghan National Police, the widespread endemic corruption. Did you see an improvement, uh, speaking specifically about police, but also about the Afghan National Army, did you see improvement while you were in country uh, to those forces and how they were able to perform their duties? I, I certainly have during, during my time there. Mm -hmm. um, a uh, couple areas where we saw major improvements. One is they, as much as the Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police and the uh, National uh, um, uh, Directive for Security, mm -hmm. uh, those three branches never really work well together. Yeah. And you sort of keep each other in normal sort of times. Well, by the time we left, they were actually doing joint, joint patrols, leading joint patrols, planning joint patrols through the auspices of the uh, uh, Operational Coordination Center in, that's located next to the inside of Canada City. So the three of them were working extremely well with uh, doing joint patrols out there uh, at night during the day. But they managed, they, they ran it all. So that, that to me was a positive step. Uh, the Afghan National Police, uh, we saw some improvement, particularly when we were able now to provide that mentorship in, at the coal face in, in, in the precinct. So not only did we have met the 97 uh, U.S. Uh, military police battalion going in there, but also having our own RCMP agents tied in with them doing the patrols, being part of that mentorship team. Certainly brought in Canadian values, the operational uh, capability, the force protection, but allowed us to actually go out there and spend an awful lot of time with them, 24, seven days a week, three days a month, forever, uh, as long as we're there. The ANA made some significant progress, I don't deny that. They, they were a little further ahead. Uh, the ANA right now, their challenge is going to be that battalion level and, and about to be able to plan operations at a time, campaign planning, and to be able as well as to, is going to be able to, to do their own logistics piece. We saw some improvement in logistics, but we saw major improvements everywhere else. Yeah. Candex have been doing extremely well uh, under the mentorship of the Canadians and the Americans. Yeah. Super progress yeah. uh, on that side. So we're quite happy with what we saw. There were some major improvements, but yeah. there is still an awful lot of work to do. Yeah. Tara, if I could maybe take this a bit further, looking at security system reform. What about the justice sector and prisons? Because those are often the missing link in many security system reform programs around the world. There's a lot of focus on the guys with guns, mm -hmm. not a lot of focus on the justice system, and where do you put them once they're arrested, you know, uh, prisons. Um, could you maybe comment on what is the state, because you're currently still serving in Afghanistan, the state of the justice and prison system, and what Canada is doing to help rehabilitate those structures in, in, in Canada? Sure. Um, the justice system is absolutely key. Uh, both mm -hmm. of them are key, but the justice system remains a significant challenge. Um, there are a limited number of judges that live in Kandahar province, so although they're mandated or they're tashkil 
is uh, approximately 27. We have nine judges uh, living in Kandahar. So there's a limited absorptive capacity uh, on the justice side. Um, and that's recognized as a challenge, and it still is a challenge. Uh, that's where we're, again, working at the national level uh, with the Ministry of Justice, uh, trying to develop alternative strategies of how we can pull judges down, uh, what can we do to increase that capacity, uh, and looking at what others are doing in other parts of Afghanistan, uh, in the justice sectors, other countries, what are they doing uh, to support the sectors. So, but that, that is one of probably uh, the weakest link in the security system reform that we're working on. Uh, the corrections one, uh, I think, is a success story for Canada. Uh, we've been there, the Correctional Services of Canada have been deployed there for a number of years now uh, and are doing incredible work. The mentoring that they're doing at Sarposa Prison for the warden himself, as well as his whole team, the officers in the prison, um, has started to actually yield significant, uh, we can actually see results now. Um, the officers were now moving from like a basic level of training up to train the trainers so they can towards some sustainability and their skills development. Um, but in recent weeks, um, when there have been incidences that occur at the prison, and the correctional services are called in, uh, we're always called in when there's an emergency, but when they're called in to, uh, to see what's going on, they haven't actually had to become involved in the situation uh, because the warden and the staff have been dealing with it based on the training they've received. So we see that as uh, significant steps forward. Um, to the extent that Kandahar or Sarkoza is now considered uh, a model prison in Afghanistan. And the next step for us is to put together a, um, a corrections model uh, program. Or we have a Kandahar model police plan. We're going to yeah. develop the same for the correctional system um, so that we can now link what we've learned at the prison level, particularly with Sarkoza, and feed that up into the national level, into the ministries at the Kabul level as a model. Uh, correctional program on how to do reform in other areas. So okay. we see that as a big success. I think that, that's quite impressive considering the prison break not too long ago as well. That's now a model thing. prison. Yeah. Now, both of you have mentioned the absolute critical importance of engaging the government, engaging institutions like the security forces. We know that it, it, it's essentially always stated as one of the keys to succeeding in these types of post-conflict reconstruction processes or state building processes is local ownership. That has to be driven by the local government and the local people, in this case, the Afghans. How, if you could remark on, starting with you, Tara, how, how Canada has done in terms of engaging with the Afghan government? Because, of course, take into consideration concerns that you're dealing with some officials who might be corrupt, some officials who might have blood on their hands, although you could say everyone has blood on their hands, but some might have particularly atrocious human rights records, some who might be considered labeled as warlords. How, how has Canada done in terms of engaging uh, government, considering these challenges? Uh, I think the most important part uh, is basically we have to support the people yeah. that the government of Afghanistan has elected. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody does have a history. Uh, yeah. There is a background to everybody we're working with. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you're supporting elected officials. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is what we're there to do. Um, so that's the starting point. Uh, of course, the governor is appointed uh, by the president, but again, it's a government of Afghanistan representatives, so that's who we're there to work with. Um, having said that, in recent months, we've taken uh, a lot of additional steps to reach out uh, to other constituencies that haven't been traditionally represented in the elected government, recognizing that there are some challenges, um, and we want to gain an understanding as to who are those other leaders? What are they uh, seeking? What are they looking for in their government? Uh, what are their challenges? And seeing how we can engage with them. But So we're, we're, we're approaching it from different levels, um, but working with the government of Afghanistan, the people that they elect, um, and then taking notice and having an analytical ability to understand what are the backgrounds who's working with them, what are the other dynamics behind it. Um, you can't ignore that, yeah. but you also can't ignore when somebody's been elected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Colonel, you, uh, working in the security sector, you're dealing with perhaps some of the most challenging <laughs> figures, <laughs> uh, with the most colorful past, so to speak. Uh, how has that worked out on, on, on that end? Well, actually, uh, it is a challenge, and then we're, already, we're just starting to get good at it. We're starting to understand who they are, where they come from, and what are their agenda, what are their motivating factors, and things like that. We're just starting. Better at it. We're not quite there yet. But certainly, we have been dealing with some 
from in interesting characters out there and to be able to appeal to their sense of duty uh, and their sense of obligation to the people has been a long challenge, but that is done in conjunction with the Rock. And, and so the commander of the Rock are intimately involved in that. We are talking about a warrior society yeah. as well, where the warrior actually has probably a bigger, uh, has a foot in the door prior, in some cases, prior to even the Rock being able to get in there. But that's okay. The warrior's yeah. war culture does work well in this initial steps of this, of this uh, effort we've done in Afghanistan. But, but I would look at it from a different perspective as well. Certainly when I started looking at the way we are now conducting operations and the stabilization effort that we're going in here, we're now having soldiers and us engaging people, the locals, and we're starting to get a better understanding of how the dynamics of the local community, the dynamics of key individuals in that and how they're related and how they're connected. So we're all contributing in some shape or form, from the bottom end or from the national level, towards that overall understanding of how all these key players or key engage, engagement uh, leaders are all going to take place and really fit into the world. The ability to link in with the local community has, has been a godsend to a lot of ways. Not only are they getting empowered and engaging them into, into a discussion of uh, governance development and security on their own, it's also providing an awful lot of information in terms of culture, in terms of how the politics and the dynamics actually do work in the world. And then use that either to leverage your activities or actually bolster up the interests of the locals, uh, particularly in, in serving their Well, this obviously is a, is a, is a very large mission. It's, it's a complex mission. There's, it's, there's you know, tens of international uh, donors working in Afghanistan and then hundreds of NGOs and international organizations, plus many Canadian government agencies. So I would ask maybe a two-level question, if I may. First of all, how well are is, is Canada working with other donors and even NGOs and other actors, stakeholders in Afghanistan? And secondly, we often hear about the, the vital importance of joined up government, or whole of government approaches, or in the Canadian context, we've often spoken about 3D. Um, General Hillier, I heard once call it Team Canada approach. You know. Um, you know, how effective has that approach been? How have you been able to work together and break down some of those institutional stovepipes that we're so familiar with in, in, in capital cities like Ottawa? So, um, maybe I'll start with you, you that's, a, that's a toughie. It's the, yeah. That toughie. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go with the first one. Yeah. Uh, have we have we cracked the, the mole here in mm -hmm. terms of the uh, the whole government D and D or yeah. the departments working together? Yeah. <clears throat> I think that the, you know within Canada, within domestic ops context, you have to work within your agency. Yeah. The supporting the supporting role. Yeah. Afghanistan is a little bit different because there's a war going on. Yeah. It's a little different. I think we've taken positive steps here to break down some of those stereotypes and misconceptions or this idea or, or an understanding of each other's cultures and an understanding of how we each operate an understanding of how the mandates that we actually do have. And, and that clear understanding obviously takes a lot of work, a lot of effort to talk to each other, clearly understand that there's a, there, there's, there's a mutual understanding that if we're going to succeed in our mission here and in theory, we've got to do it together. Because this is not a military solution. Uh, what's going on in Afghanistan is not going to be done by the military. It, it is not good governments and good development. But quite frankly, the military doesn't necessarily have all the skill sets to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, not even our job. Really think about it. So uh, we've got a long way. Open lines of communication, mm -hmm. talk, a lot of calls to, to Ottawa, and trying to get ourselves to understand. Yeah. What we did learn publicly with the wall of things is that if we do talk and we are integrated at the very beginning of any planning process, is that when we need, when we're in, in Afghanistan, we need to talk to Canada. We're now talking with one voice as opposed to three or four separate courses. So the integration of our planning, the integration of developing a narrative, as Tara alluded to uh, during our presentation, is key. Because once we have that, we're all working to the same sheet And it's a lot easier to convince our group of masters or our masters back at home that this is, we agree to this. This is how it's going to work. And it will work if you allow us to play in that sandbox with those rules and regulations. And that, to me, I think is, is the beginning of something that's going to be wonderful. I, th I don't think in the next 30 years you're going to see anything different in Afghanistan. We're going to be in a nation of threat environment. It's going to be, could potentially be violent. At the same time, too, it would be a shame for us to repeat mistakes that we've done in the past, send the military in first or send someone else in first, and then eventually try to piece them this thing and bring it together. But I think we should just pull it all together at one, with one mind. Yeah. So, how is it working with the military in the field, uh, especially working very closely in Kandahar? Um, you know, often, you know, I've I've often 
people have come up to me and said, well, it's, you know, the, the military, they outnumber the civilians. Why aren't there more civilians in the field? I mean, uh, do you feel outnumbered? No, we're definitely yeah. outnumbered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think you can do the number. Yeah. Uh, we will always be outnumbered. Yeah. Um, that's a given. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think, uh, I mean, we bring particular skills to the mission, and it's sort of, it sort of moves away from you know, how many people do you have. So we need to have enough people yeah. to do the work. Um, I think we're working uh, very well together. I think the provincial reconstruction team is a model uh, of how that's how that's coming together. Uh, in the last year, uh, we've been, we've had a commanding officer of the provincial reconstruction team along with the director of the PRT uh, who work incredibly well. So that's the military and the civilian head of the PRT. Um, that has created dynamics that then push down to the rest of the organizations, to the soldiers, and to the officers. Yeah. Uh, the political and governance, uh, political and development officers, uh, they see that example. We've had incredible synergies going on at the yeah. PRT. Again, it takes a lot of work, uh, but I think we've seen uh, some real steps forward in how that has come together. Uh, Task Force Kandahar, the headquarters, is then also uh, taking steps forward. I think one of the things that you need to have, though, and as civilians sort of uh, get to understand more, and as the military understand how we work, you need to have the counterparts, yeah. the people who they're interacting with, uh, to address the issues and solve any conflicts or um, any tensions and dynamics that come up. Uh, because you, you can actually solve them very quickly, so long as we know who each other's counterparts are. Um, for how we work with uh, other partners that right. you were talking yeah. about, uh, the work that we're doing with the Americans, also a completely fascinating time to be there. <laughs> Uh, again, at the PRT, we now, uh, the deputy director on the civilian side is an American. Okay. Uh, so we have Canadian leading uh, deputy American and the deputy, uh, the American team of civilians then moving in, uh, and a significant pres presence of Americans coming in, particularly the, uh, the stabilization teams yeah. that will be going out. Uh, those will be uh, outnumbered, uh, the Americans will outnumber the Canadians very soon. But the way we're setting it up is that we work uh, any of the decisions and planning that we're now putting in place, we not have to. We have to tackle the civilian military uh, dynamic, but we also have to tackle the Canadian U.S. all at the same time yeah. before we put any plans, in, uh, any processes in place. So we're working really closely with them. Again, not without challenges, not without historical baggage, um, but everybody's under a lot of pressure in the time frames, and we have to produce. And yeah. people are working together. Um, we've got the same thing at the task force headquarters now. We have two deputy commanders, one Canadian, one American. Uh, and we want to see my inside work with our American counterparts at the U.S. regional platform. So, interesting dynamics. <laughs> Adds another layer of complexity. But uh, I think everybody recognizes that given the results we have to achieve in a short time frame, it's a requirement. No choice. Yeah, knowing who your counterpart is is, is one thing. Because prior to the chief of staff point, I spend more time chasing people for advice or, or, or uh, input or whatever else. My staff is running around trying to find something. Establishing the chief of staff is now giving us one person to talk to and raise the issues. And quite frankly, the relationship uh, that is really built on trust and, and respect. So we're, that actually facilitates the problem solving and crisis management or however you want to do it. And, and it gets the right people around the table very quickly to come up with some quick solutions. And not really getting, getting the adults involved in the discussion and really regularly resolve it our level. All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. Okay.